oh, this reminds me, this is how we're going to go out tonight. Because I'm, I'm going to shortstop a million questions that are going to be coming in. Okay. In the, in the next month. Okay. Because all these people are going to write in and say, what did we think of sugar? The, the series Sugar with Colin Farrell, right? Which is a private eye, noir inspired private eye show. Have you seen any of this? No. Okay. Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so it's, it, the show is interesting. I'm, uh, I will just say this. I think a couple of years ago, I was contacted by somebody from Apple wanting to pay me a consultancy fee for an unnamed show that Apple TV was producing that they said is in your area of expertise. And they wanted to set up a meeting where I would act as a consultant to this thing. But I, I declined to do it because of Apple's contracts that basically stipulate that everything I would say to them, they would own. Yeah. And all the ideas would be theirs and all this stuff. And it's like, I don't, I don't really need to be paid a few hundred bucks to, to give ideas to one of the biggest corporations on earth. Right. Yeah. So I, I declined to participate. I am now absolutely positive that the show in question was this sugar. And I'm also astounded. I'm not going to spoil anything, but it's amazing to me that people were saying, oh, there's a huge reveal coming up in the show that turns everything upside down. And it's like, if you haven't actually figured out what that reveal is by the second episode, you are definitely not paying attention. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I haven't seen it all the way through, so I don't know how they're going to handle the rest of it. But Colin Farrell is terrific. He, I mean, I really, really enjoy watching him on screen. And Amy Ryan, who we don't get to see enough of on screen, because I think she is also terrific. And she plays an aging punk rocker in this show, and she's she's pretty good. And Ben Mankiewicz has a, uh, has a small role in it um, where he basically plays himself. Yeah. Or me, <laughs> depending on how you look at it. Because it takes place at the American Cinema Tech. There are all kinds of, you know, it's it's a film screening where he's interviewing uh, legendary producer, uh, whatever his name is, something Siegel, uh, who's played by James Cromwell. Uh, very good casting. Uh, anyway, so the show is very interesting. It's over-directed in my estimation, but a lot of shows are these days because they they have to... They have to buzz your eyeballs to make sure that you are paying attention at all times and not changing over to some other streaming service. So, um, and, and uh, they use, they get away, I think, with using massive amounts of clips from film noir movies. Oh. Because, because they're so subliminal that they're within the uh, rights usage. It's like if you use less than like two seconds, you don't even have to pay for it. And they're, they use them so quickly, like cutting them into action scenes and stuff. And, you know, a lot, there are a lot of films that they use. <clears throat> I have a sneaking suspicion that they wanted to ask me like, which of these movies are in the public domain so we don't have to pay for them. Yeah. But you can figure that shit out on your own. <laughs> You have a especially, especially if you're one of the biggest computer corporations in the world. So yeah. I didn't feel the need to assist. So have you seen Ripley? I have. I have seen the entire series. Yes. What, what did you think? Um, I had mixed emotions about it. Um, I know that you, you love the fact that he was a back to being Highsmith's sociopath in the film. I, I, my legs hurt watching the show because there was so much freaking walking up and down stairs in Italy, <laughs> which, which is lovely to look at. Yeah. Um, 
people were raving about what's interesting about that. And I'm not saying this with any authority, mind you, but people have raved so much about the visual look of that series that I wonder if they would feel that enthusiastic if it was AI, because, because a lot of that stuff was, was artificial intelligence. A lot of the backgrounds and things like that. They'll, if you've watched the show, you know the whole scene where he disposes of the body out by the viaduct. That whole thing is was done in a computer. There, there yeah. was no exterior scene. That was just created in the computer, um, which I don't really have any. It just occurred to me that after all of the hubbub over AI, well, that really they, actually makes me angry, and this is why. In a late night with the devil, which to me oh, is oh, which I saw, and okay. we can talk about that too. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we can talk about the A and I that. So do you want to finish? Sorry, did you want to finish up your thought? No, I want to. I want to hear why the why the idea of AI and that makes you angry. Okay, so in late night with the devil. So if you don't know, the bulk of it is just basically a lost episode of a 1970s talk show. And when they go out to commercial, they have these little art cards, right? Which was typical of the time, the transition from mm -hmm. the show into commercial. So there's three of them. Okay, those were partially composed with AI. And people were actually talking about boycotting the movie. Oh, for that's that. What and it's just like really <laughs> now which which just i mean and there was so much art design and artists working on that film no i thought all that stuff i thought the recreation of a talk show from the 70s was was perfect it was brilliant. yeah yeah. yeah, I don't. I don't really care how it was done. It doesn't yeah. matter that much. No, but but literally, me. like I said, there were it was the, the three inner inner title cards that take you out from into the commercial. That how was an AI as opposed. You mean they talked it into the computer instead yeah, of so illustrating guess, it themselves? Yeah, even though they still worked on it anyway. So they they ran it through to try and get illustrations because you want yeah, to do that. I yeah. mean, it's a small detail, but it is something that actually, and it looked really, and that's the thing, it, it, those actually impressed me when I saw them because yeah, they looked the accurate only, to the period. It's interesting. The only and thing. Literally, it's like, really, seriously, this is like, how much AI do you think? I mean, in the Star Wars films, they're using footage of like Peter Cushing to put him into Rogue One. I didn't see y'all boycotting yeah. that film. Yeah. It's it's just, it's very tricky because obviously it's all just tools. Yeah. It's all just tools. And I don't really have a problem with that, especially when it comes to graphics. Because to me, it's just like whatever the tool is that gets you a graphic that, that you need, that's fine. So therefore, is an exterior of a location in Italy by a viaduct, is that a graphic? Or is that... A location you know what i'm saying yeah. so i mean if you can create it in a computer and trick people into thinking it's actually a location and and so much of that it 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 appeared to me to be computer enhanced imagery a lot of the yeah. time oh yeah in, in ripley and and my only complaint about the show i some of the performances were incredible i love the uh, inspector yeah, he's great. Uh, he, yeah. he is just fantastic. Uh, I liked the depiction of um, of Dicky. Mm -hmm. You know, he he seemed like a legit uh, interpretation of that character. And that that actor, John Flynn, is is kind of intriguing. Did you see the outfit? The the Mark Rylance movie. Yeah, that was a pretty cool film. I, I recommend it. It's called The Outfit. It's about a very, very small film. It was made during COVID. Mark Rylance plays a British tailor or a cutter yeah. who moves to Chicago and opens a haberdashery for gangsters in a, in Chicago. And it's it's just a one set movie. Oh. It's very, very stagey, but it but Mark Rylance is the star, so it's really good. And and that John Flynn uh, is in that, and he's he's very good. Anyway. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure what I thought about um, Andrew Scott. I mean, part of the time I loved the performance because he just seemed so strangely sociopathic and weird. But then part of the time I was like, 
I don't know if this guy is carrying all eight episodes of this show. You know, yeah. after a while, it was just like, and it was interesting to me how padded out it was. Like, you know, one episode is the disposal of the body. Yeah. One entire episode is just getting rid of the body. Yeah. And as a, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure how I felt about that. I mean, if it leads to more Highsmith adaptations, I'm all, I'm all for it. You I'm know? still holding out hope for the, 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 the boy who followed Ripley. That's the yeah. one damn book of, her, of the yeah, Ripley will, series. I, and that and I they could, well, this is, this is the thing. They could do it, you know, a series. They're clearly setting it up because they introduced the John Malkovich character at the end of the series, yeah, who, you know, which is going to lead to Ripley becoming an art forger and all of that. And, but I, but I question whether this guy can actually, whether audiences will stay with him for, for this long format storytelling. Yeah. Because I think that, um, I, yeah, I mean, I'm not, the one thing I was going to say about it taking so long to deal with the body, because they kind of do that twice is that. One of the things, because I, I decided to reread the entire Ripley series, so I'm I'm on the third book now. Good for you. But when I was rereading him, so one thing I really like about Patricia Highsmith is it's like, what the hell do you do with the body? <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, it's you know what you kill someone, and then like there's something really, and it's kind, and in a way, it's kind of funny too. But there really is something about I love that aspect of. The Ripley stories this is the fact that she, Tom does these things, and then it's like, and and I was saying, gotta, this, yeah, and you got to deal with it, and got to deal with it. You, you've committed the crime. Now you have to figure. I mean, that's what the whole thing is about, right? Yeah, it's putting putting the reader in Ripley's shoes, and it's like, well, he had this moment where he lost his mind. Yeah, well, that's debatable whether he lost his mind or not when he kills these people. I mean, clearly, Dicky is a is a premeditated thing yeah. you know when he when he kills freddie it's like it's a spur of the moment thing you know where yeah. he makes this impulsive decision but then like okay now what and so i get like they were going to do every step of the way they were yeah. going to show you everything that goes into disposing of that body but still that was like 50 minutes yeah it was like a 50 minute show yeah. you know yeah. and you know you know it's just I'm hanging in there with it and I, and I'm not going to be critical entirely of the show, but it, it was, it was hit and miss for me. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm oh, sorry. I just talking about the whole thing. <laughs> Since we're talking about the Ripley novels, I just love the second one because once again, Tom sort of impulsively kills someone in his own house this time. It's actually really kind of hilarious. <clears throat> and you, my first reaction was like, what the F Tom? And then I was like, all right, you're a sociopath. Um, but then what's really funny, so he buries the body once, but then like the police are coming, so he has to like move the body and get rid of it a second time. And it's I'm sorry, it's like hilarious. And then of course he drags someone else and helping him for the second one. It's like well, this is this is what made Heisman so great, is I mean, the black humor of those books is incredible. It's like yeah. so so you want to be a master criminal? There's a lot of hard work and stuff that goes into that. You know? I, I think Tom has a lot of luck. I'm not sure if I consider Tom a master criminal. I think he's a, he's got the luck of the devil. I mean, he yeah. is smart and stuff, but he also has the luck of the devil. Tom is just like. Well, something. that was one thing. Did you, did you for a moment, not to spoil anything for people, did you for a moment buy the disguise? When when he has the interview with the with the inspector, I felt like they could have done that better. I that's that's what I felt. I mean, they yeah. tried to show you he's setting he's stage managing by by playing with the lighting and everything. But yeah. then but then the way they did it, you could clearly see him, and from the camera angle that was the inspector's point of view, it's like this guy's a cop and he doesn't realize he's talking to the same guy he already interviewed. Yeah. Yeah, that that was a little that was a tough pill to swallow. Yeah, that one I thought was yeah, a little weak. But I and I like the fact that they made I mean, she's still I like that they made Marge dumpier or I mean, it's as much dumpy as Dakota's 
what's her name can as be. As Dakota Fanning can be, Dakota yeah, Fanning but she's not be. Gwyneth Paltrow. But yeah. she's not Gwyneth Paltrow because I, I, yeah, because like you know, I, so I, yeah, I've just been thinking about Ripley a lot. I actually saw a really good video essay on YouTube where they they were talking about the first two movies, the Talon Mr. Ripley and um, Purple Noon, and just the way that in the book Ripley has like a um, what's the word I want an unstable self. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know and in the way that in both those movies they wanted to categorize him and kind of like in the first one okay he's just a greedy guy that wants all this stuff and then in the second one they make him into this sort of more like cl closeted man that's sort of a tragic character and I don't know I don't really like the talent of Mr. Ripley like I think as a, as a movie like I get why people like it but like she had this clip of the director saying, you know, I wanted to get to the heart of the story. And it's like, I mean, yeah, Tom's bisexual, but I don't think that that's a driving force of his personality. I just don't think his sexuality is that important. And also he's, I mean, he's bisexual, but he's also sort of, he's not very vested in sex, which is not uncommon right, for people right. with psychopathy. So he's not ever in. So I was like, where are you getting like this tragic, gay character and also i mean he also murders two people i'm sorry i'm just yeah. not gonna be that empathetic towards him yeah and you it's know? also kind of the humor of it to me or the, yeah. the humor and the tragedy of it is that he's willing to go to such extraordinary lengths to achieve such mundane things you know he he just wants to have this other life yeah and and i just and it's so weird that he will commit these horrendous crimes to achieve it. I mean, that's why he's like a total psychopath. Yeah. And I think also really importantly too, is also Tom commits crimes just to commit crimes. Yes. Like when he's in yes. New York, he's doing this IRS scam. He never cashes those checks. He does it for the thrill. And then after he gets this comfortable life, right, he gets Dickie's money, which is not a lot, but it's a comfortable life. Even, and he marries this wealthy French woman. Then he gets involved with his art forgery thing. Yeah. You know, and he, and he says he doesn't really need the money. And that's always the thing. But that's also, that's actual um, dark triad behavior is is that desire for, for those. It's sort of like, you see that in Saul, in Better Call Saul, too. Yeah. Where there's times and he's it's just so, doing stuff to And do it's that. also interesting because in that sense, I see a lot of uh, corollaries between the Ripley character and, and uh, the Walter Neff character in Double Indemnity. Yeah, it's, absolutely. it's not like he it's not like Walter really cares that much about the sex or he's that, you know, obsessed with this woman. He just wants to commit the crimes. He, that's that's what yeah, he wants yeah. to do. He wants to get away with it and prove that Barton Keys is full of it. You know, yeah. that you actually can get away with this stuff. But it, it's so great because, as you know, the one of the the greatest uh, things about uh you know when people say if you're going to become this type of person you have to be so expert with lying because you have to remember what you said right that's why it doesn't pay to lie because if you start lying you have to remember what you said and at some point you're going to forget you know those were the best moments in the ripley show when he he would slip up yeah and then and it's like oh i you know, that wasn't what I said before or something. And all of that was very, very effective. Um, we'll, we'll see where it goes. You know, I, um, I wasn't totally familiar with this actor, Andrew Scott. I know he was on Fleabag and it was very popular in a couple of other things, but um, it seemed to me to be, and this is the thing, a very, very good serviceable actor, but when you, expect somebody to carry eight hours of storytelling and then there's going to be another season with another eight hours of storytelling that that actually takes a very special performer yeah to, to pull you it takes bob odenkirk yeah you know it, it, it or, or ray seahorn for that matter you know or brian cranston to do all you know you got to keep hanging in with them yeah and uh and i don't know if this if this guy and the nature of the character being so guarded and, and so, you know, self-contained, if that's something that an audience will, will want to commit to.
Well, and I think that's kind of the problem whenever they adapt to Ripley, right? And I was talking to my mom about it. I want to buy her all the books for Mother's Day. Um, she likes crime fiction. So I thought, I'll just get her all the books. Um, but when you read, one of the things I said to my mom when I was talking about the Ripley novels is I find it kind of soothing in a way to be around Tom because Tom is so like, yeah. kind of <laughs> shut down. And there's something like, I find Tom really re oddly relaxing because of that. But I totally understand that asking people to- I'd like to see that on a book jacket. <laughs> Oddly relaxing, Anne Hawkins. You know, I think Patricia Hawkins. Highsmith would probably really liked that comment. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure she would. <laughs> I'm sure she would. And and we won't get into the whole. You know, you could you could write a master's thesis on trying to suggest that Patricia Highsmith is Tom Ripley. I you, you know, know something. But, I I find that kind of stuff like I'm a very it, like do the text. Doesn't doesn't matter. It doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. And know? also, I mean, some of the stuff I write, I don't, you know, is not who I am. I mean, that's part. It's just like you know, some of the like you know, Andy Robinson, right? He played this totally sociopathic character. He's fantastic. He's a really nice guy. It's called acting. Yeah, yes. or Dan or Dan Durie, right? I yeah. mean, you know, you could not be more opposite of your screen persona. It's the same thing with writers. I mean, writers. I, I just think that people just really want to turn writers into like crazy artists. I mean, I, you know, so, and, and that, you know, I mean, when you sit down to write, you're, you're creating a world. And of course, you know, your ideas and stuff are in there, but it doesn't mean that, I mean. Of course. And, you know, yeah. it takes, <laughs> I, it takes uh, more discipline than anything else in the world to write novels. Yeah. And the fact that she did so many of them, that, that, stands above everything else everything else you say about her is secondary to the fact that she produced this incredible body of work incredible so, body of work yeah. yeah and it's just like agatha christie was like you know she was the least like she has one character she did a self-insert character in some of her novels who's a who's a writer <laughs> i've her, been did you did you happen to read uh highsmith's diaries no i have not the, the big Should volume of that came out. It, it's really interesting to see her, you know, because she kept really good diaries. And and I've been I've been dipping into that. You know, I read most of the early stuff when she went off to from Texas, went off to New York to go to school and kept a diary of all that. And it's 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 interesting, not just from a writing standpoint, but from her figuring out who she was when she was yeah. in New York and her crushes on other girls in the class and stuff. Um, it, it was very, very interesting. And you can see her discovering herself as a writer in these yeah. diary entries. But then, you know, it's just, that's just all background to the books. Yeah. Because, you know, if you've, if you've read The Price of Salt, you know, which they made into Carol, the movie, like, do you need to read the diaries? <laughs> you know, the, the book is the, is the end result of all of that. Yeah. You know, so anyway, and I got to go have a cocktail and eat okay. dinner. I was just wanted to say one more thing about about uh, the town, Mr. Ripley, the novel. And so one thing they never put into any of the adaptations that it, I'd always kind of wish it would get in there is just his friend Cleo in New York. He has like two friends in New York and one of them is Cleo, who's just and they have such an interesting little relationship. And it always kind of yeah. makes me I mean, I understand that's something you would cut, but it's just that's like one of my favorite parts of the of the book. It's just it's just an insight into his character. And they found found someone like Well, they London. had a, they had a chance in this one, but they and it was uh, long enough they could have put Cleo. It was long in enough there. <laughs> that Cleo could have been in it. Uh yeah, it very, very uh and, and the fact that they cast Malkovich in the thing when he has played Ripley himself, you know. I didn't it, that, that threw me out of the that moment. I think they could have cast somebody else. It it seemed to me to be a little bit of stunt casting. Is that yeah. what you're suggesting? Yeah, and yeah. It, that was that was probably that really bothered me that they did that. Because it was so great because I love it when it's casting like the uh the Italian inspector who yeah. you think you've seen before but you can't place him and he has such a vivid face and such an incredible presence yeah. that he he commands the screen every second he's there then malkovich shows up and and it's like that's john malkovich yeah yeah you know and 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 he does the john malkovich 
thing, you know, which yeah. is to be kind of off putting and creepy. And um, I, I thought that was a bit of a gag that didn't work for me. I, yeah. find, I find a lot of these shows suffer from that. That's why I'm kind of withholding judgment on sugar to see how they, you know, as we like to say, how they stick the landing at the end. But I felt the same way watching that, the new Monsieur Spade thing with Clive yeah. Owen. It's like I'm buying it and Clive Owen. Clive Owen is is an example of an actor who can carry eight oh, episodes yeah. of, a, of a show, right? You'll just watch Clive Owen. He is absolutely brilliant. Uh, but then in the last episode, they started bringing in these recognizable actors that were totally out of place. So Alfred Woodard comes in in the last episode and it's like, what the hell is going on? I mean, this whole this show just imploded. I didn't yeah. even finish the last episode. I was so furious with how they how they mucked it all up at the end. Yeah. Hey.